Good morning. And welcome to worship. This is Pastor Nick Van Dam with Stella and Anderson United Methodist Churches. I'm glad you're here. It's another wonderful day to gather together, to worship God, to give thanks, and to continue to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, many of you may be thinking, wait, we did that a few days ago. Christmas, right? It's over. Now it's on to the next thing, on to New Year's. When in fact, in the life of the church, we are in the midst of Christmas. Christmas lasts for 12 days. It's not just a song, it's a season. And I invite you to, uh, to revel in it because something as big as Christmas, something as big as God coming to be present with us is something that deserves more than one day of celebration. Many, many days. So let us bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we rejoice in your birth. We rejoice in you coming to be present with us. We rejoice with the shepherds. We join the choirs of angels. We rejoice with all those who heard the good news and with all those who are privileged to pass it along, to share it, and to live it. God, this day, help us. Help us to fully celebrate and to remember and to be changed by the gift of Jesus Christ in our lives, in our world, in our church. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, as you may notice, we are inside for this, uh, this worship service, and that is because it is windy outside. You may be able to tell by my hair. I've just gotten done setting up things outside for our drive-in service. And uh, for those of you that are attending that, I give thanks. Um, and uh, for those of you worshiping with us online, I am so grateful for you and for this opportunity to be brought into your homes, into your lives. That is a wonderful privilege. And it is in this time where we lift up those joys and those concerns, those parts of our life. I encourage you guys that are worshiping at home to share those with each other. And if you feel comfortable with me and with everyone in the comments section, so that we can all be praying together, praying for people, praying for families, praying for those in our lives that, um, that we long God to be present with and God's people to be concerned for and compassionate towards. Uh, we have several people within our congregations that I keep in prayer every day. And I encourage you to, uh, to keep those that you hear about in prayer, not just today, but every day. We also want to lift up those, um, those people that live lives of service, be it in the military, be it in government, be it on the front lines at the hospitals, in fire stations around the country, around the world, for those that work uh, to feed the hungry and care for the sick and the dying, for all those people that live lives of service, especially those that live lives of service inspired by the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. Let us lift them up as a joy, their lives, their examples as a joy. And I have definitely wanna lift up those that are suffering the, the negative effects, the harms, the hurts, surrounding the COVID-19 virus that just continues to rage on. Um, there is news of, of a uh, more contagious strain out there for those impacted by that, for those fearful of that. Um, let us invite God in. Uh, I wanna lift up the joy of Christmas. Christmas was a gift. It was observed in different ways. It was experienced in different ways, but it came and it was wonderful. I give thanks for our ability to worship together. For those that uh, participated in our drive-in worship service and the live nativity outside in the cold that was drawing us close to the reality of, of what it would have been like in the manger. And I give thanks 
for that, for the new revelation that happens every year, for how it is alive in us, and, uh, and for all of the expressions of love and compassion and, and care that, that uh, came to my attention and that were expressed on me and my family. I want to especially thank those that sent gifts for William, those that sent gifts to us, especially the churches. Uh, we are humbled because serving and having the privilege to love these churches, to love you guys, is a reward in itself. But to experience your gratitude and your thanksgiving and to see that um, is so fulfilling, so gratifying, and, and so humbling. And so I, I want to express my thanks and the thanks of my family for the love that, um, that you express daily and the love that you expressed on Christmas to us. So thank you for that. I want to give thanks for the, the gift of technology that allowed us to, to uh, share Christmas, William's first Christmas, with my parents and my sister and her family. Um, and the, the gift of technology and the phone that allowed us to connect with Megan's parents. Um, for those people that keep those things running, even though I don't really understand how they do it, I want to give thanks. And, uh, and for those that weren't so privileged this year, for those that didn't have the, the same kind of food, the same kind of shelter, the same kind of um, perks of life that, um, that we enjoy, we want to lift them up to God. We give thanks for them, and, uh, and we love you. And we pray God's help, protection, and care, and for the, for the hope of God to live in all people. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give thanks for Christmas, for Christmas that comes to all people, and for how the first Christmas came to those that were considered lowly in places that one wouldn't expect. God, we give thanks for how you care for those that sometimes we overlook, sometimes we don't see, how you see. And how when we do not feel like we are seen, you see us and you love us. For those out there that are not feeling seen, for those out there that are struggling with loneliness or detachment, for those that are concerned about how tomorrow will go, God, we give thanks that you are there, that your love is there, and we pray the revelation that, that your love be felt, much as the wind today is felt, that the effects of your love may be seen, much as the wind today, the effects are seen. God, we give thanks for every good and wonderful thing in this world, and we pray your help in every part of the world that is broken, that is hurt, that falls short of the glory of the kingdom of God Jesus told us about. Thank you, God, for coming. Thank you, God, for being with us and continuing to be with us in the midst of it all. And for teaching us and showing us, by example, how we are to be and whose we are to be. Teaching us to pray the prayer that oftentimes sustains us and redirects us when we are struggling. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, now is the time in our worship service when traditionally I invite folks that are gathered together to, uh, to offer up their tithes and their offerings uh, to support the ministry of this church. I encourage you who are worshiping with us online um, 
to consider, to consider uh, supporting the ministry of this church, not just worship on Sunday, but all the ways that, that these churches, Stella and Anderson, re seek and work to bless the communities in which we are privileged to be. And uh, I encourage you to, um, to consider and to see how God is guiding you in that way. The uh, addresses of the churches where you might send those tithes and those offerings uh, are, will be in the, uh, the text below. But right now, I invite you to bow your heads for a moment and pray with me over those tithes and those offerings, those resources that are entrusted into these churches, that God direct them and be present in their dispensation, that, um, that the work and, and the gifts that we receive might be fruitful in their effect by the power of the Spirit. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give thanks for the generosity that your love inspires. For just as you are generous with us in grace and mercy and love, we too seek to mirror that generosity in the support of your church and the love of our neighbors. God, make these churches, make their ministries, and make the, the, the fruit of this gift reflective of the great love of Jesus Christ. Help us to be generous with each other, to be generous in ministry, to be generous in love and forgiveness and grace and mercy as you are. And as we do so, God, make us fruitful in bringing others to your table, to bringing others to your light, that everyone might be so blessed as to find a home with you and to find to find you in their hearts sustaining guiding loving every day we pray this blessing upon our churches and upon everyone that we meet in the name of Jesus Christ our lord and our savior amen I'd like to share with you a reading from the gospel of luke Chapter 2, verses 22 through 40. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it was written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what was in the law, stated in the law of the Lord a pair of turtle doves, or two pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and he was a man who was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came to the temple, and when his parents, when the parents had brought the child, Jesus, to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, you are now dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation of the Gentiles, and glory for your people, Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what they were hearing, at what was being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to his mother, Mary, the child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner hearts of many may be revealed and the sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was, in, in, she was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after their marriage, then as a widow at the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there 
with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Israel. When they had finished everything that was required under the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town in Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and favor of God was upon him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is about the time when I would begin feeling down after Christmas. Most years, this was about the time when I'd opened all my presents, I'd had fun with my family, I'd eaten almost all of the sweets, there weren't any more left by this day, and it was just a few more days until school or work picked back up again. After all the hype, after all the excitement, after all the buildup, the great moment had come and gone. Has anybody else ever felt that way? Have you? Yet I don't feel that way anymore after Christmas. We, we've all spent weeks getting ready in anticipation, ready to celebrate, ready to experience Christmas, to celebrate Christ's birth. Such anticipation, such preparation is appropriate. It's right, it's good. I hope our preparation, our, our anticipation at church during Advent helped you to celebrate and experience Christmas in a new way, to see God moving, to welcome Christ into the world. Because welcoming a baby takes a lot of work, a lot of preparation. There's a lot that goes into it. If anybody can tell you about it, it's me and Megan. About this time last year, we were just starting our preparations for our little boy. I hope that your preparation allowed you to have a powerful Christmas, a meaningful one, a moving one. I hope God's spirit rested upon you and that you experienced Christ and his presence today, you know, in the world, in a new way. And I'm glad, so glad that we gathered on Christmas Eve and that we are gathered here online today in worship and celebration of Christ our Savior's birth on this third day of Christmas. Because here's the thing, when it comes to having a baby, there is a lot of preparation. There's a lot of work. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. A lot of reading, finding out beforehand. And then there's a lot of new experiences after the baby arrives. You certainly know what I mean if you're on here because I've, I like to share some of the firsts. The first car ride home in the car seat. The first time you try to feed him. The first time he coos in approval. The first time he laughs. Oh, that was a great day. And one that I didn't expect. The first time I was able to do a children's moment with William. You saw on here. It was so wonderful to have him here in church, to talk to him, to share with him. I, I didn't anticipate that one being so wonderful. And then there's the many firsts that we don't share or remark on. First time he spits up. First time we can't find a burp cloth. First time he rides in the car 
to go for a Walmart pickup. As it turns out, the observance and the celebration of first isn't a new thing. It's something that's been going on for quite a long time and something that Jesus and his parents experienced 2,000 plus years ago. Just before the scripture we shared today, there was one about how eight days after he was born, Jesus was circumcised and given the name Jesus as the angels had instructed. You see, in, in the Hebrew tradition, especially at the time, there were many firsts that were delineated in the law, the law of Moses. That was one. And then 40 days after his birth came another. They went to the temple for two different reasons. One was for Mary and one was for Jesus. Under the law and under custom at the time, Women were considered ritually unclean for 40 days. And at the end of 40 days, they would go to the temple and be declared by the priest ritually clean. Also, um, so this was why Mary was going. She went. The other reason was for Jesus. Now, under the law, the firstborn male child would be dedicated to God to serve in ministry, to serve at the temple. And there was a, a, a typical way for, uh, for parents to kind of buy back their child so that their child can go into the family business or take care of family property and that sort of thing. And this was to sacrifice a lamb. But provision was made for the poor to sacrifice two turtle doves, which is why that's in the song, or two pigeons which was more affordable. And so they were taking Jesus to observe these traditions. Because if there's only one thing we know about Mary and Joseph, we know that they are of great faith. And that observing the practices of that faith was important to them. To share that with Jesus was important to them. And their great faith was something God recognized in them when he entrusted Jesus to them. But the ironic thing about it is I, I wonder, would people consider Mary unclean since her union, since the or, or origination of Jesus was of divine manifestation, that this is God's son, how could she be considered unclean? The other is it seems a little ironic that Jesus, whose life they know is destined to be in service to God, is still offered a sacrifice for at the temple. And yet these are things that are done that are proper and good. And so they did them in observance of the law. Now they're going to the temple and we need to get a clear image of what the temple is like. It's not like churches that most of us experience, where everybody can know everybody else's name in a church this size, or <clears throat> most of the activities happen at a certain time of day or a certain day of the week. This was the one temple for Israel. And so whenever there was a sacrifice, whenever there needed to be something done at the temple, that's the one you went to. So it was busy all the time with people coming and going, sacrifices being made, all sorts of stuff. And so it's remarkable that when Simeon is there, he's able to pick out the Holy Family. Because there are probably so many other like families, because babies are born all the time. There's so many others there every day, and yet to him they stood out. Now, Simeon is an interesting character because we don't know a whole lot about him. Sometimes people uh, think he might have been a, a priest, but Scripture doesn't really tell us. 
It just kind of implies that he's of advanced age and that God is with him, that the Holy Spirit rests on him, and that the Holy Spirit has communicated to him that he won't die until he sees the Messiah. Now, I wonder if, if Simeon, after having this revelation from God, frequented the temple. Now, if he worked, maybe he took his lunch break and he went to the temple. Uh, maybe he was reti retired and he just went there as frequently, you know, once a day, looking, hoping today would be the day that he would see the Messiah, the one God had promised. Has anybody ever experienced that? You know, longing for something, hoping for it to happen, anticipating it. Just maybe that's where you're at right now, hoping against hope that something happens, waiting for something to happen. I know a lot of us have been waiting for something to happen, for life to change for the better for everybody. Now, can you imagine being in Simeon's shoes when that day finally comes? He's so enraptured with joy. He sees the Messiah. He goes over, he scoops him up, and he proclaims the good news that this is the one that God had promised him about. We know that the Holy Spirit moved him to the temple to experience this. Can you imagine having the Messiah in your arms? Now, Master, let your servant go in peace according to your word, because my eyes have seen your salvation. You prepared this salvation in the presence of all peoples. It's a light for the revelation of the Gentiles and glory for your people in Israel. The praise now on Simeon's lips celebrates the light and salvation that has come for all people, Jew and Gentile alike. This old man, his face with the markings of years, looks down at this tiny child and can see what is to come. He knows because it has been foretold and Simeon is excited. He cries out something like, Yes! Finally! Hallelujah! This is what I've been waiting for for so long. Now I can die in peace. Simeon knows that he holds in his arms not just the fulfillment of the promise God made to Simeon, but the promise that God made to Israel and the hope for the whole world. But Jesus was just a baby, only 40 days old. Still, Simeon knew. It's really astonishing. It's wonderful how God works that way. How God can, how God became something so small So that, so that the world might be changed. As the reformer Martin Luther put it, God became small for us in Christ. He showed us his heart so our hearts may be one. And you know, that's, that's been my experience around babies. Babies just change you. You look at a baby and it, you melt. Now, you know, I'm goofy most of the time. I don't, I don't need a baby to make me goofy. But I've known some stoic, some tough, some hard people. People that have, have had to be tough. Men and women. I've, I've had relatives that, uh, especially strong women relatives, that, you know, life was tough and made them strong and tough. I've known men that worked so hard, their, their hands are just covered in calluses. 
They're stoic. They don't laugh at anything, at least none of the goofy stuff I do. But when they see a baby, they melt. The most grizzled man becomes a teddy bear. The most severe-looking uh, grandma starts talking in a high-pitched voice, smiling so big at the baby. trying to make the infant coo. God came down not to, to inflict pain on those that do evil, not to crush Rome, but as an infant to inspire that kind of love, to nurture and promote tenderness and care and mercy and love. God came down to us in Jesus to provide us what we need. Forgiveness, mercy, peace, grace, and most of all, love. Simeon waited his whole life, not minutes, not months, but decades to see the Messiah. Israel waited generations. When we see Simeon, who has waited so long, when he rejoices, when he finally holds up that Christ child, in his arms, he holds in his hands the fulfillment of his and Israel's greatest hopes. Sometimes people ask, what does it matter, Christianity, faith? These questions are asked because the world the world implies, the world tells us that all that we need in life can be had if we work hard enough, if we just are smart enough, if we just pick the right path, if we just do the right things. We can have the American dream. But the world is broken. The world is fickle. Things happen that nobody anticipates. Suffering happens. And ultimately the world and the promises the world make fall short. Sometimes, sometimes my brain fails. Sometimes my strength fails. Sometimes the world and I fall short. But when, when that happens, the love and the grace and the promise of the Christ child do not fail. Faith may always be had in them. And faith in Christ gives hope always, everywhere. When we are like Simeon, with nothing before us but death, we can still rejoice. We can still celebrate and experience unvarnished joy. A life without Christ can be dark. It is restless. And there is no lasting peace. A life without Christ, even if it lasts a hundred years, is too short. But when we embrace the love of God, the love that God has brought to us and shown us in Christ Jesus, it turns all that upside down. It makes life matter. It gives meaning to even 
a short life, fullness, richness, and the promise of eternity with God. It makes all the best things possible. Simeon knew that. He experienced it. He cried out in joy because he saw it revealed in Jesus. I hope this Christmas you did more than, that we did more than just celebrate with good food, exchanging gifts, singing the songs. I really truly hope that each of us welcome the Christ child in to our hearts, into our lives, into our very being. Because here's the thing. Christmas, Christmas is every day when Christ is in your heart. That joy, that hope, that revelry, that that goodness. Not necessarily all the airs and decorations we put up around, but the heart of it. What, what inspires it all is something that lives and resides within us all the time because of the love of God, because Christ is alive in our lives. His peace, his joy, his light, and his hope, they never go out. They always continue. He is forgiveness. He is grace. He is love. And we celebrate that at Christmas time. We celebrate that Christ is here and stays with us every day. Life is full of firsts. A life with Christ. When Christ resides in your heart, just like with any new baby, there's that first time you share your faith with somebody else. The first time you invite somebody along to church, to Bible study, into a conversation about the difference Christ has made for you. The first time you sit and just listen and try to love on somebody right where they are, as Christ does. The first time we begin to walk, the first time we begin to crawl in faith and then walk and then begin to run and then begin to fly. The first time we love our, our family a little bit better because of God. The first time we love our neighbors and friends a little bit better. The first time we love our stranger, the strangers in our lives better. And then the first time we love our enemies with the heart of Christ. And we may, with each day, be expectant of that next miracle, that next fruit that God has borne in our lives, that God will reveal to us each and every day as the Spirit rests on us and moves us and brings us to rejoice, as Simeon did. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we give thanks for Jesus, for how Jesus saves, how that salvation is open to us, and how Jesus saves everyone. How he comes into a dark and broken world and is greeted by those the world considers lowly. People from all lands, from distant and near, showing to us that 
that the salvation of Christ, that the love of God with us is for all people in all places, that it is for you, that it is for me, and that it is for us to share everywhere. God, inspire in our hearts the faithfulness of Simeon to go where the Spirit moves us. Help us to love on our neighbors as Christ loves on us. Perfect our efforts and allow us to bring the hope of Christmas into the lives of every person we meet and help us to reside and live in that hope every day. While we might move on to where you lead us to next, God, let us take the joy of Christmas with us. Let us take the hope and the peace and the love of Christmas with us, that we might bring it to every person, to every dark place, to every hurting person, that they too might know of your peace, grace, love, and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And now, my friends, I am grateful for the time that we have spent together. And I'm grateful for you and your ministries. May you take this love of God with you May you take the joy of Christmas. May you never come down from the joy and the excitement and the love of God. May that dwell in you and burn in you every day of the year. May it be for all 12 days of Christmas and beyond. May you be so blessed and so charged in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and always. Amen.